You're listening to Life Repurposed with Michelle Rayburn, where you'll find uplifting and practical advice for everyday living, creative inspiration for do-it-yourself projects, and recommendations for books and resources that will encourage you to embrace your life repurposed. I'm your host, Michelle Rayburn. Hello there. I'm so glad to have you with me today for episode number 112. I am honored to have a guest today, Dr. Marlene Carson. She talks about her story about how she went missing for eight months, and she's going to explain in the interview why she was missing for eight months when she was 15 years old. Dr. Marlene Carson calls herself a thriver of domestic minor sex trafficking. She's a member of the U.S. Advisory Council on Trafficking. She's an author, a coach, and a founder of several organizations that help to free people from being victims of trafficking and help them get on their feet again with next steps, new place to live, jobs, all sorts of things. Marlene is one of America's foremost authorities on the subject of human trafficking. While many have a textbook knowledge of the perils faced by teenage girls and young adult women who are forced into prostitution, Marlene knows this from her own personal experience. And she's going to tell that story and how she ended up turning that into a ministry. Through faith in Christ and sound biblical teaching, Marlene's misery became a ministry to the exploited. She will share at the end of this episode about some of her writing and ways that you can get involved in her ministry and also ways that you can get involved in learning how to help people in your community. So you want to stay tuned for that. You're going to find the links in the show notes at michellerayburn.com slash 112. And there I will have links to the places that Marlene talks about in our interview and also a link to her book. She is one of the authors in the Life Repurposed book where she tells her story in a chapter in the book. So we aren't getting into that chapter quite as much as we are into what she has repurposed in her life as a result of that challenge. So here's my interview with Dr. Marlene Carson. I am so happy to have you on my show. Oh, I am honored. I'm totally honored. So I've been looking at your bio. I've been looking at a list of a lot of things that you do and your life looks overwhelming to me. So I want to know, what do you do for fun? You know, normally for fun, I um, binge watch Netflix (laughs) and I shop and I go get ice cream and popcorn and I just relax. Mm, I I do Hallmark movies. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I absolutely love traveling. And oh. so pre-COVID, I traveled 20 days a month. Wow. Yeah. That's a and lot. So, um, it's, and I love it. Absolutely love it. And so now I, uh, yeah, I binge watch Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> so we met in a sort of interesting and random way. Mm-hmm. I had this book. I was, I put out a call for submissions for life repurposed. And instead of emailing me, you called me. <laughs> you just yes, dialed I, up the phone. I was so moved when I saw that, uh, Michelle, because several years ago when I was going through a hard transition after being exploited, this pastor um, kind of ministered to me and she said, God is going to redefine and repurpose your life. And at the time, honestly, my life was in shambles and I could not see that happening. Mm-hmm. And so when I saw that book, I said, oh my gosh, I have to be in this book. <laughs> and actually, it was sent to me by a mutual friend. And so when she sent it to me, uh, she said, you have to see if you can get in this mm-hmm. book. She thought the submission may have been too late. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm so glad your story is in the book. And I've been interviewing authors and Along the way, I've met so many wonderful people. Your story is one of those that moved me a lot because you talk about something that we don't always talk about in our everyday conversations, and yet it is so important for us to talk about it. And so you began your story with talking a little bit about your childhood and how you ended up in a crisis moment, like already from the time you were a teenager. Can you go back a little bit and tell us how you ended up there. And then we're going to talk about the good news of what you're doing with that now. Okay. Very good. So, um, when I was a teenager, this couple moved into our neighborhood and I was only 13 years old. Uh, I hung with three other girls and we were together all the time. And 
little did we know that this couple, the man was a trafficker. Mm -hmm. And so when I turned 15 years old, um, it's a long story, but when I turned 15 years old, I ended up being one of his victims of sex trafficking. Wow. So do traffickers look for a certain profile or how do they, how does a trafficker choose who's going to be essentially a victim? Well, I think that different traffickers have different criteria, but you people should know that it is a business model for them. Mm. This is truly a business model. And I believe that what they saw in me was an entrepreneur. Mm. I believe that they saw some, I didn't meet, I still don't meet a stranger. I am just very friendly. <laughs> I give, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I just think that they saw that characteristic. And one of the things now I even realize, um, I tell people that I've ministered to that the greatest level of your anointing can also be the greatest level of your attack. Mm. And so that's kind of how I can show you where people's lives will end based on where is the enemy really attacking your life. And mm -hmm. the enemy attacked my life in many ways in relationship, um, just not with men, but family relationship. This mm -hmm. thing totally, um, it just wrecked our family. Mm. It, it literally did. You know, we, we're fine now, but for years, it wrecked our family. And so um, I think a trafficker identifies ambition. Mm -hmm. I think they identify um, the entrepreneur spirit. I think they identify personality characteristics. And then they, um, the fact that I did not meet a stranger, that was appealing to them. So did you tell your parents or how long was it before somebody knew that you were being trafficked? No, I did not tell my parents. And well, I was missing for eight months. Mm. And so um, when I came back, it was a trip. And when I came back from that trip, I did not tell my parents. He had threatened to kill my parents and I did not tell. Um, and that was over a weekend. And then he actually took me for eight months. And so they knew what had happened. Wow. And do you know if they looked for you? Oh, of course. I mean, just think about it. It's, if your child goes missing, what would you do? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm from a very healthy family. My Both parents in the household, Christian household. I'm the youngest of five siblings. Of course. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can't even imagine being in that, in their shoes and not knowing right. where you were. This is right. before the internet. So it's really hard to go looking. Now, this was before 911. Mm. <laughs> this, I, I, you still dialed a zero on the telephone. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and you had a rotary phone in your house, or, or maybe we did have the push button by then, but yeah, this was a long time wow. ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did you get away from him? There was a bust. He got busted. Mm -hmm. So he, it was just, it was uh, four of us. And so he got busted. Actually, it was more than that before from my neighborhood. He got busted and, um, and they returned us back to our parents. Wow. So did you go back to regular high school? I did not. That was very hard. Yeah. So I left a virgin girl and came back pregnant. Wow. So yeah, it was, no, life was never the mm -hmm. same. No. And yet I get chills because I think of how far you've come now and what God has done with that. You have your doctorate degree now. Yeah. yeah. So obviously yeah, something's when happened. I about, when I think about, whew, when I think about what it's, it's overwhelming sometimes to think about how far the Lord has really brought me from, mm -hmm. um, I literally sat on my couch yesterday for about 20 minutes and I was just stuck mm -hmm. because it, like, it was just unreal that the opportunities that have happened, I, like I was sharing with you before we, we, we went live, uh, we've been doing bus lately. And the ironic part about that, I'm in my city, which I'm very, very seldom in my city, but um, so I'm in my city and we've been rescuing girls that I grew up with their parents mm. And I'm like, what is really going on here? But to be able to get these children and get them safe, mm -hmm. it's just, it's just amazing to me. It's just absolutely amazing. Yeah. So we're going to talk really soon about what you're doing in the organization you have, but 
I'm wondering now, a lot of times we're thinking of human trafficking in other countries because that's where a lot of rescues happen. Mm -hmm. And even with um, Destiny Rescue, who we're supporting with some of the royalties from the Life Repurpose book. But tell mm -hmm. me about trafficking in the U.S. Are they, is Destiny out of the country? They're mostly out of the country. They're working on doing more rescues in the U.S. One of the things that's been a barrier has been that there are so many laws about whether you can't just wear a camera without telling another person. Oh, for sure. Uh -huh. So they have to have law enforcement involved in their rescues. So there are they are working on an arm in the U.S. right now. You're mm -hmm. working on rescuing people in the U.S. What are the what are the numbers like? How many people? How many young people are trafficked in the U.S.? Well, that's really hard to say because the reality as a survivor, I know that when it's not like a census and someone's going around mm -hmm. counting traffic victims, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and it's, so it's not, I cannot answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it's, it's higher than what's reported because who is actually waving their hand saying, hey, I'm right. being trafficked. You know what I'm saying? I believe that, so, right. But I will tell you that it's more than most people could imagine. Mm -hmm. I will definitely tell you that most people in the United States think that it is an overseas pro um, problem or they feel like it doesn't happen in their neighborhood mm -hmm. or in their community. And I remember one of, when I opened up my first shelter in 2008, one of the first um, victims that we actually rescued, she lived two doors down from the mm -hmm. governor. Wow. No, so don't think that it's a, a inner city issue, a drug issue. I've never been on drugs a day in my life. Mm -hmm. And honestly, to this day, I've never tasted alcohol a day mm -hmm. in my life. And so it, it's just not what people think. There, yeah. there are a lot of myths and misconceptions when it comes to sex trafficking. Yeah, I think that's important to put out there because, you know, we hear the stories in the news and you know, we hear of the, the Craigslist stories or yeah. the Facebook traps yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. But I don't think we hear about the everyday young people who mm -hmm. are sitting in the classroom seats all the time right. and mm -hmm. have like something going on in their life that we know nothing mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something else that we don't, you normally you all don't hear about. You don't hear about the other side of trafficking. A lot of people give and they donate to trafficking organizations, but you don't hear like like myself or there are lawyers that were friends of mine that are survivors of sex trafficking. There are medical doctors, there are um, scientists. So you all don't normally see the other side of yeah. it. So we talked about the podcast and, and those are my peers. And so I know that one of the episodes we're going to do is going to be called I Thrive. Mm -hmm. And we just don't survive, but we thrive. I love that you call yourself a sur sur thriver. A thriver. Yeah, a sur thriver. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're going to show you all, you know, we're just going to expose to the world what it really does look like. And there is life after what they call the life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to really show what that process is of how God transforms your life. Oh my gosh, he transforms, he transforms. Yes, he does. <laughs> yes, yeah, so your story, obviously you've gone to a whole different place now. You've started a ministry where you're rescuing people. Tell me how that came about. How did you go from recovering as a victim of trafficking to become somebody who's a champion for people who are being trafficked? You know, um, when I was a little girl, my grandmother would pray in the closet. You ever hear how people pray in the closet? <laughs> well, my grandmother really did pray in the closet, you know, and she was probably bigger than the closet. I don't know how she fit her little stubby <laughs> self in the closet, but she did. And she would go in that closet and she would quote the scripture when the Lord turns again, the captivity of Zion, mm -hmm. we were like them that dreamed the dream. That's Psalms 126. And so uh, when I was in captivity, I used to hear her voice. Mm -hmm. That was the only thing that kept me alive because my grandmother would say when and not if. Mm -hmm. So I knew God had a plan for my life. So once we go through the process of being rescued, being taken home, um, I was very angry. I was very bitter. I could not have a conversation with you like this back then. And, and um, but there was something in me that felt peace at church. 
there was something in me that I wanted to be around the music. I wanted to, that was the only time that I felt real joy mm-hmm. was to be in the presence of the Lord. Now, then I didn't realize that that's, that's what was happening, but I always went to church. And so um, I remember sitting in Sunday school and, and the pastor said, um, we just got to get close to God. And when he started talking that, I said, I want to be close to God. Mm. And I just have been on the journey. It is absolutely amazing journey. It's funny to me how Christians say they're bored because I don't know how you get <laughs> bored with God. I just don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do that because I don't have a boring day in my life. Trust me. <laughs> but, um, the process has not been um, all easy, has mm. not been a flowery bed of ease by no means. But the greatest, um, I think the resiliency that God has put in my spirit and in my heart to just keep going, no matter what, just keep going against opposition and against all odds, just keep going. And so that's that's what I've been doing. Well, I can see that you keep going because you started... <laughs> You've been on the U.S. Advisory Council on trafficking. I'm on it right now. Yeah, I'm on it right now. So you're serving in, tell me what you do in that role. So as a member of the U.S. Advisory Council, I was appointed um, by then President Trump. um, And we basically consult all government entities and and advise them on protocols, policies, and um, recommendations for victims of sex and labor trafficking. So you're you're working on that end of it, but then you're not just in an office somewhere. You're out in the field, oh, and totally. you're participating. Mm-hmm. So you have the you're the founder of Rahab's Hideaway, mm-hmm. and also Rahab's Hope. Tell yes. us what those are. So Rahab's Hideaway is an organization I started in 2008. It is housing, and Rahab's Hideaway is for more of a crisis. So victims that are coming out of the life fresh out of addiction out of, I mean, a lot of trauma, things like that. Um, But so that started in 2008. And over the years, I realized and recognized that victims are keep going back into the life because they can't take care of their children. Mm. They can't pay bills. They can't get a decent job. And so Rahab's hope, what people um, don't don't recognize with Rahab in the scripture, um, when you even mention Rahab in the scripture, it always says, Rahab the harlot. Mm -hmm. It talks about her profession, but people don't realize that Rahab was an entrepreneur. Um, So people, when you look at Rahab in the scripture, um, she had stalks on her roof, remember? Mm -hmm. Because she used to sell. And then she had the red ribbon. She used to make it and she would sell it. And unfortunately she got a brothel because men were going there to buy sex, (laughs) unfortunately. But um, so she was an entrepreneur. And so what Rahab's Hope is all about is education and entrepreneurship. We are trying now to get a greenhouse because we want to teach women how to grow their own food, how to, uh, we have a candle company, uh, soap, lotions, um, all that kind of stuff. And then um, we're, we're, um, the ladies will, for another company, they have a smoke nuts company, pecans, it's, it's amazing. It's called Naturally Cravables, mm-hmm. naturallycravables.com. And so they will smoke their nuts for that company. Uh, but we want to teach them how to garden, grow your own food. Um, we're going to do flowers in one part of the greenhouse and we'll teach floral design. Um, so just to show them what they can do with their own hands. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So giving a next step, essentially. Are are there organizations out there that rescue, but then don't give a next step? Like where do, where do most people go after they've been rescued? Well, it's very hard because housing, just think about this, Michelle, there is a housing crisis around the country period. Mm-hmm. And so for, for specialized populations like um, ho- um, homeless people, some veterans and traffic victims, it's kind of hard to get housing for them. Mm-hmm. When I first started in 1988, um, in 2000, 2008, there were only 88 beds for traffic victims in the United States. Wow. 88 beds. And so honestly, in my city, um, there was about 400 for dogs. And I'm not against mm. dogs, not by any means. I'm just saying, let's let's get our priorities right. in order. Perspective. You know? Yeah, let's look at the, pers- yeah, look at our perspective here. And so I think that, um, 
we're doing research now, our organization is on housing in the United States for traffic victims, and there's just not enough. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes law enforcement is very frustrated because they can do the rescues, but where do they go after that? Yeah. That's the reason why Rahab's Hope and Rahab's Hideaway is so important. Mm -hmm. So how, what does it take to run an organization like that? Do you have a whole staff of people? (laughs) <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> no, we have three people. <laughs> but that's why I look like this. I'm looking like a mess today because we have three people that do everything. But we have a lot of volunteers. We do have a lot of volunteers. And honestly, Michelle, we've been doing this work since 2008 and we've never been funded. Wow. Yeah, we've never been funded. Um, but God always provides. You know, I feel like this is his ministry. He touched the hearts of people. And he provides it. And so I'm not going to stop doing it because of money. I will never do that ever. I went eight years without a paycheck, Michelle. Wow. This is what we do. This is not something after you lived it, you understand the dynamics of it. And I wouldn't want anyone going through this experience Mm -hmm. ever. I can't stop. Trust me, I (laughs) try. I love that you're using your own perspective in helping to minister to somebody else, because you can minister in a way that somebody who has not walked in your shoes cannot minister. And so when you think about, you said you were angry when you came home and you weren't your normal self, you you're able to come in and say to that person, I know what that's like. I know why you're angry. Mm -hmm. And you have a right to be. Yeah. I will never take that away from a, from Mm -hmm. a victim. You Mm -hmm. have a right to be upset. When you see children that have, especially, I think 78% of all sex traffic victims come out of foster care. Mm. And so when you think about that, you've been taken away from your family for whatever reason, placed with another family, and then they abuse you, Mm -hmm. that you have a right to be angry. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Let's just process that anger and and the redirect it so mm-hmm. you don't hurt anyone or no one hurts you mm-hmm. um but they have very every right to be angry yes mm-hmm. you also have another organization that you started the switch anti trafficking network what is that yeah so switch the switch is all public policy education and awareness and so we have curriculums that we teach we actually teach the church so we have a curriculum called let the church say amen and amen is a social justice like auxiliary just like a usher board or a choir Mm -hmm. it's a social justice arm of the church and amen is an acronym for um, advocates mentors entrepreneurs and navigators and it helps traffic victims or people in transition to go through a process and not go through it alone Mm -hmm. That's so Mm -hmm. important. And for us to realize that, like you said before, this is not like a a city issue. This is a nationwide, every church needs to pay attention to this issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So because when you think about it, I I was telling the church, a pastor earlier today, how um, today's church, if it's open, (laughs) but today's church um, you have those that have been involved in domestic violence mm-hmm. and addiction and mental health, a lot of trauma and trafficking. And we go to the church, mm-hmm. but the church has to be taught. I think the church should be taught on trauma informed care. I think the church should be fully equipped to handle some of the issues of the world today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the in general, the church is equipped to handle the issues of people in the church. And Correct. so if you grew up in the church, and if you lived a fairly, yes, n- quote, normal mm-hmm. life, you fit in. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. if you've experienced trauma, or yeah. anything like that, it is often mm-hmm. hard to find a place. What do you totally. say to people then who are trying to find that place in the church? What's your message to the person who's trying to figure out where they belong and where they can get help in their own church? So um, sometimes that may not happen. Mm -hmm. And so the reality of it is find a community. You know, it may not always be in church. There are a lot of support groups. There are a lot of communities that are Mm faith-based. It just may not be in the four walls of the church. But I'm a church girl. So for me, that, that's where I found my peace and my joy. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not, that may not be for everyone. It's so interesting because when I think of COVID and how the churches were shut down, 
what if that church was the only place someone went you know what i'm saying yeah. then they would just be yeah out of luck yeah <laughs> and yeah. so yeah th- you know we have to first of all church we are the church the bible says we're the ecc- ecclesia mm-hmm. we are the church the church is just not a physical building yes we are the church and so i can have church right here in my house by myself trust me i do it every day <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You can worship and pray and do everything you would do in the church and, uh, and have a beautiful experience, just you and God. Mm -hmm. Tell me what then you say to the people who are comfy, cozy in their church, not really wanting to get too involved in the lives of other people. Let's give a wake up call. What do you want to say to the people who need that wake up call? You know, what's very interesting when, um, probably about four years ago, you know, we had a opiate epidemic, our country. And it was so interesting to me how many of those people that you just described was calling saying my son, Hmm. or it's my daughter now. It's, you know, it's, it's then got close to home. And so I tell them, look, you have to have a personal relationship with God and, and God serves. Christ serves people. You have to get up and take action. We cannot just sit just idle by and act like, you know, the world's going to be okay. No, you are in the world for a purpose and a reason. Find your purpose, get off your tail and do something about it and do something to help somebody else. Yeah. Open our eyes and look because the hurt and the need is all around us. We can just pretend that we don't see it. You know, Michelle, in the facility that we just got, it's a 32 bed facility. And so it's um, eight bedrooms on four different wings. One of the wings we're going to use for missionaries or those that want to learn about trafficking. Mm. So they can come, they can stay there three, five or seven days. They will help with gardening. They will help the ladies. But one day, they one full day, they will be taught on sex trafficking and what to do about it in their community. Because people think it doesn't happen mm-hmm. in their community. Oh my gosh, those are the communities that it happens most because they're so blinded to it and they don't want to learn it. Yeah. So we're opening up a place where um, we call it the Social Justice Academy, where people can learn um, what it looks like, how to identify it, and what protocol do we use to um, when we do see it. I love that you're you have this vision for the future. So if you dream big, where are you going next with all of this? What's God leading oh you God. to? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, and um, he has definitely been stirring my heart. I, um, I, I, I love ministry. I love the word of God. And so that's probably, I'm almost 60 years old, Michelle. You do and not so, look 60. <laughs> well, I am. <laughs> and so um I plan on building these things and handing them off to my predecessor and really going into full-time ministry in in another sense. We want to talk about your website, the resources that you have and where people can find you online. You're an author too, Marlene. So you have all kinds of books out there, but tell us about your latest book. The latest book is a biblically based book. It's called 12 Steps to Transform the Exploited Soul. It is a true story of a 14 year old girl who was trafficked by a police officer. Mm. And uh, yeah, unfortunately it's a true story, but um, it has a um, portion of the book. The 12 steps are actually for volunteers for in the church. And what you said, um, how to wake them up. Well, that book is going to wake you up. That's for sure. That's for sure. It's going to cause you to take a look at yourself and to see where you really are in your walk with Christ and in your walk with your community. Um, so yeah, you can get that book on Rahab's Hope of Ohio.org. And I will link to that in the show notes so that everybody has the link because your other books are on there as well and yeah. links to the ministries that you have. If somebody wants to support the ministry financially, do you have a place where they can do that there too? They can do it all on that website. All right, good. Because there may be somebody listening who says, I want to get involved here. Or somebody who says, I want to be educated more. How can I take that next step? So I think it's an important topic. We could talk all day about it. But what I really want you to have the opportunity to do is to say what's on your heart to somebody who is experienced trafficking and is trying to heal and to somebody who... Uh, wants to get involved and really wants to know what to do next. So what would you say first to the person who's struggling to get back on their feet? 
Well, if you're struggling to get back on your feet, reach out to us because this, so my, um, I get great joy in empowering people, empowering people to be more for God, empowering people to find out who they are. Michelle, when I was um, coming out the life, I felt like I didn't have any skills. I felt like I couldn't get a job, had children, didn't know what I was going to do. Someone sat me down and they showed me how to utilize my transferable skills. I never even heard the term transferable skills back then, but now that's one of the things I do. I teach people who feel like they are worthless that no, there is a treasure. The Bible says that there's treasure in earth and vessel. There's treasure inside of us, all of us. We just have to excavate through all the dirt to get to the treasure and pull it out. And, and God will allow you to use it. Cause he said, he gave us power to create wealth. Mm-hmm. And so that was the one thing that I would say, the other thing that's really on my heart is the, is for mothers, mothers of trafficked children. Um, I know what that's like. My mother passed away and my mother passed away with a lot of shame as if it was her fault. Mm. And it wasn't her fault. It was definitely not her fault. And no matter what I said to her, she still felt that shame. And so I really want to say to parents that um, have raised your children to the best of your ability, and you feel like this still happened and you're living in shame and guilt and condemnation, God does not want that for you. And so one of the things that we're doing is we create an a online support group for parents of trafficked children, just to get you the help that you need, help your child walk you through the process and, um, and really just be a support to the family because when the family is whole, the children are whole. Yeah. So they can find that on Rahab's Hope of Ohio.org as well. They will by Friday. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting our website updated. They've been working on it every day. So yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. By the time this episode airs, then people oh, cool. will be able to get that and any other resources that you've talked about. Uh, what would you want to say as we wrap things up today? First of all, thank you for hosting this show and, and um, the repurpose just All of our lives have purpose. And sometimes we can't find it. We don't know what it is. Take what you did have in your life and repurpose it. Mm -hmm. And watch God really move in your life. He'll do a wonder. I mean, he'll just leave you just in awe. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much, Marlene. I'm so glad that you were able to take some time to be with me today. Thank you. Marlene's story and how she has turned it into something beautiful just blows me away. I hope that you were blessed by her telling her story as well. I want to remind you that the show notes are at michellerayburn.com slash 112. There you'll find the links we just talked about. You will also find a link to Destiny Rescue, which is the organization that I'm supporting with some of the royalties from the Life Repurposed book. You can also find the Life Repurposed book there and get that and get Marlene's story there's an audiobook version now, so you can listen to the book if you prefer that. I encourage you to join our Facebook community, Life Repurposed Community, where you can meet other people and be encouraged and lifted up as well. I will be back again next week with another interview. Thank you so much for joining me. You've been listening to Life Repurposed with Michelle Rayburn. Check out tips, resources, and inspiration at michellerayburn.com. I'd love it if you would subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, or Spotify. I'd also love it if you would like, review, and share the information about this podcast with your friends. Thank you so much for listening.